morning, pig. Oh, well, let's see. That was a movie, wasn't it? Good morning, Vietnam. But I guess that's not going to work. How do these folks? Glad everybody's here this evening. Uh, we're getting just a tad bit of a late start. We had a little accident on the interstate that caused us to just now get here, but we got here all right. So glad everybody was here, uh, especially online. Any viewers there, we're glad that you're with us this evening as well. Uh, let's start real quick with a word of prayer. God, we are thankful for just taking care of us, allowing us to be here, blessing us uh, with this uh, uh, freedom to be able to be here to study your word, to spend some time together, and trying to learn more uh, about you and how to uh, serve you and be more like you. Uh, just pray that you'll be with us uh, this evening in, in this study. And, and um, for all of our friends and family here, we pray your blessings and your guidance, uh, your wisdom in, in the daily activities. And uh, we pray especially in all things, um, whether uh, in our lives or around the world, may your will be done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. With, um, when, when we think of somebody saying, uh, this is a really great person. Um, this person uh, is the greatest of all time. What kind of imagery do you come up with, typically? Especially, say, the worldly view. Um, when, when something like that, a person is described. Typically, maybe uh, things like um, being wealthy or powerful, or you know, their family being uh, wealthy, powerful. Um, someone of influence. Someone of um, fame. Um, someone who maybe accomplished some big, great task. Maybe they won the Nobel Peace Prize or because they invented uh, the, the next best thing since sliced bread, you know, or um, just uh, those kind of things that um, we typically think about when somebody says, this, this person is great. But now, what do you think the person looks like when God, them, God himself says, this person not only is great, but he is the greatest of all time. He is greater than anybody who has lived to this point. Hmm. Actually, you know, Jesus himself did describe someone that way. Well... Now, what is this person, who was this person, and what were they like? Well, first of all, he was, they were not born and in into a wealthy family. They were not wealthy. They did not gain wealth. They did not gain power. Um, did not have any kind of special social status. Um. Born to really, really old parents, an oddity, so that when, uh, you know, maybe when he was a little kid and went to the uh, Little League baseball games and things, and all the parents are there, and uh, all the other kids were going, why do you keep coming with your great-grandparents, you know? And he said, no, those are actually my parents. What? Really? Okay. Something very unusual. No formal education. Um, born into a priestly line, but wasn't a priest. Didn't hold the specialties, especially in their day, that a priest would have had. Uh, you know, the priest of the tribe of Levi and such. They um, grew up, when they left home, they didn't go out and start a business, become successful, become a fa famous orator, business person. Instead, they go out and live out in the wilderness, um, kind of like becoming a hermit-like person, uh, lived a hermit-like homeless type life, um, 
wore very strange clothing, especially even you know for their day. Today's by today's standards, we might envision more of a Jeremiah Johnson type person that um, wore deer skins and a um, big old huge bulky uh, buffalo coat, coonskin cap, you know, with the tail sticking off the back and everything. Lived out in the woods, mountain man, beard down to, you know, here and everywhere, hair out everywhere. Ate bugs, ate wild honey, strange diet. I'm sure he ate other things too, but though you know, definitely did not sit down at a, a typical dinner table with the family every evening. In short, you would describe this person as odd, definitely odd. Yet, this is someone who Jesus himself, in um, Matthew 11, Jesus himself said, that this person at that time was the greater, was greater, uh, greatest person who had ever lived to that point, greater than the people such as Moses, Samson, David, King David, greater than famous prophets like Isaiah, Greater even than Abraham? Abraham? Greater than Abraham? Okay, now this, okay now, Jesus. Especially when you're talking about uh, the, the time that the Jewish folk and things. Hold on now. Abraham's our, the father of us all. Abraham is whom God gave the promise, how we became the chosen people. There is none greater than Abraham. We base our lineage, our whole salvation upon being descendants of Abraham. If I can trace back my lineage, and they kept their lineages, lineages, especially when you're a Levite. They, where they could, in paper, in writing, they could see and look and say, I can trace back, and here I am. I, I'm a descendant of Abraham. Father Abraham, there was none greater. But Jesus said, that this person was greater than even he is, he was. Well, even though we come across this person in the New Testament, actually he is the last of the Old Testament prophets. By the time he's on the scene, it's been 400 years plus since the last prophet, Malachi. It's been over 500 years of any kind of recorded reference to appearance of angels speaking to anyone um, there in Israel or Ju uh, Judah. Been a long time of silence from God. But, um, oh, and, and even... At this point, even Matthew, when he uh, records, gives a record of this person, he points out the fact that he was actually prophesied about, much like Jesus was. We hear a lot of prophecies, a lot of the prophets, uh, speak, Isaiah, Jeremiah, so, making prophets, we, uh, prophecies. We have prophecies that refer to Christ, the Messiah. But this person actually was prophesied about as well. Um, in Isaiah, for, for what is us, us now, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, um, Matthew quotes the, uh, a, the prophecy in, in his record, Matthew 3, verse 3. He says the prophet Isaiah was speaking about this person when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Not everybody gets a prophecy by the great Isaiah, prophet Isaiah. So who is this person? And what made them so special? Well, 
Let's start just a little bit before this person. Before the time of Jesus, there was this very elderly fellow, a Levite, a priest, named Zacharias. He and his wife Elizabeth, they had prayed for a long time. God, please give us a child. God, please give us a child. We want a child. Didn't happen. Eventually, they basically kind of gave up on the idea. They got a well advanced in age, came to the conclusion, it's just not in God's plan for us. Well, Zacharias, being um, the uh, priest and, and the Levite, <laughs> One of the tasks that the priest had was to be assigned for a week at the temple to perform various tasks. And and one of the tasks, a special task that not everybody was allowed to do, was to go into not the Holy of Holies where the Ark was, but but the, the section outside that. The, the holy room were and burn the incense, light the incense on a, on a daily basis. And the, and the priests were selected by lot. They cast lots to determine who would be selected. And all for many, 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 many years, Zacharias had been serving as a priest, and the lots would be cast and things, and he was always passed over. But this time, he got chosen. Ooh, I mean, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Okay, because once you did it, once you got to serve, and that's it, you didn't get to do it again. Okay, oh boy, oh boy, I'm getting to go, I'm going to do it. And you see Zacharias, he's going, yes, I'm ready to, go. I'm getting to be the incense burner, going to be the incense burner. So, you know, that had to be exciting. And also, <laughs> you know, I want to make sure and do this right. Because obviously, there are lots of stories in times past that you know, especially the priests that were uh, serving it within the temple, they remember the stories of some of those that did it wrong <laughs> and some of the bad things that happened to them. Um, I don't want to mess this up and make God mad, okay? So here's this time. Zechariah goes in, and he's pre- uh, preparing the incense to burn the incense and things. Supposed to be in there all by himself. No one else is allowed. And then all of a sudden, there's somebody right there behind, beside him. Where did you come from? I imagine probably one of the things that went through his mind was, who are you? How did you get in here? You're going to die. You know, I'm going to get killed because I let you in here. Uh, you know, all kinds of things are probably going through his mind. So that had to be very startling, very terrifying. And as he observes and notices, he realizes this isn't just some person. This is an angel. Oh, boy. Probably if it were me, he's probably thinking the same way I was. Uh Uh-oh, I've done messed up. And he's fixing to tell me, he's fixing to zap me right now. What have I done? What did I do wrong? So he's probably very, very, very nervous. He's a bit on the scared side. I would be too. But the angel, how can you remember? 500 plus years since an angel, a messenger from God, any record of, has been down to talk to anyone. Long time. And he comes to give Zacharias this message. God's heard your prayer. And he's going to fulfill it. You and Elizabeth, you're going to have a son. Now, if I was John, and John probably went, I mean, not John. If I was Zacharias, Zacharias probably went, well, it's a little late now. Um, Why didn't you come up with this about 50 years ago? Um, If you haven't noticed, I'm, you know, older than dirt. 
and my wife is pretty much, I'm not going to say how old she is, I'd be getting in trouble, but she is going to be well past that childbearing age. Um, don't think that's going to happen, Angel. Well, obviously, uh, the angel of God, the messenger of God, not just any messenger, Gabriel, sets him straight. He says, look, I stand in the presence of the Almighty. I stand in the presence of God, and I, he sent me here to tell you this, and you're going to say that he can't do it? You don't believe it? Well, Zacharias, you're going to be where you can't speak until your son is born. Born. And sure enough, it comes to pass. Um, he serves out his term. He goes back home. Wasn't long after that, Elizabeth, she becomes with child. She gets pregnant. Yes, obviously, a miraculous thing. She was well past the bear childbearing years, so this was no accident. This was no just human thing that had. This was a a God thing, no doubt about it. She has her child later, and only at that point is Zacharias allowed to speak again. After he puts in writing what the angel told him to, to do, which was, you're going to name this child John. And that's our special person. John. What was John, what was so special about John? Besides, okay, he's already started out now. Miraculous birth. Miraculous situation. But it gets better. That was not what uh, gave Jesus the, uh, and you know, led Jesus to say this is the greatest person of all time. Of, or to this point, I should say. Um, John had a very special task. Again, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Previous prophets pointed towards Jesus, foretold of Jesus down the road. John is not only going to get to do that, but he is going to be the herald of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is going to go forth, and he is going to announce the coming of the Messiah and make way, a path for the Messiah. He and he alone, no one else, John, John the baptizer, a herald in those days, especially in those days, you, you know, you get just about everything was um, monarchies of some form or fashion. And the herald preceded, as the monarch was traveling someone from point A to point B, the herald was someone who was assigned the task to go ahead, well ahead of the monarch, and had two jobs. One, announce the coming of the king. He's coming. Make way. Everybody, get ready. Get out of the way. He's coming. Go to the place, the, the next town where they might be staying the night or so. Make arrangements for them to stay. The king is com coming. Get the room ready. Get everything prepared. Get everything cleaned up. Get the food ready. He's coming. The other thing was he had servants that went along with him that cleared the path. The roadway could have had tree limbs or a, a tree gutter or maybe an ox cart was being pulled along, had some grain in it, and the wheel fell off, and the cart dumped over and spilled their load all over in there. They're blocking the road. We can't block the road for the monarch. You don't hold up the king. You clear that path. You make a way. You don't roughen, you don't make it where the road is rougher. He's got to go around. No, the king did not get delayed. The king did not get diverted. So the herald made sure that happened. John 
announced Jesus' coming. John made the way, cleared the way, presented, made the, the path for Jesus. How did he do? It wasn't a road. He wasn't going down through there, going, okay, get the, let's get the dirt off the road because here comes Jesus. No. His way of clearing the path was the people. Making ready the people for Jesus to come. Jesus, the King of Kings, preparing the people for him and his message. That was John's job. But what was that message? Well, again in Matthew 3, he, he tells us. Um, verse 2, his message is simply this. Repent. Repent. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he backed this up with a baptism of repentance, washing of sins. Now, baptism was not new. This was not a new thing. Baptism had been going on for centuries. All kinds of baptisms, all kinds of ritual washings, Jewish pagan alike, okay? But a baptism of repentance, a baptism of, for repentance, a washing of sins, that was new. Him, John telling the, the people, this included the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the scribes as well. You've got to turn. You're doing it wrong. You've got it wrong. You need to get things. You need to turn away. You need to stop this sinning. All of this stuff are your empty rituals, the meaningless lives that you're living, the constant sinning. You've got to stop. You've got to stop and Turn back to God. This stuff about that you've put in your reliance upon, and this really struck home with the Pharisees and such, this stuff about saying we've got it made because we're the chosen people because we are descendants of Abraham. Look, I've got my lineage. Going, Remember, i got our lineage and our bloodlines. and I can trace myself back to I'm a descendant of Abraham. Therefore, I got it made. He says, "Uh uh-uh. Doesn't work that way. That doesn't mean a hill of beans. So that was a a very strong, very different message for these people to hear. Uh, He points this out again. Matthew does. Back again in chapter 3, looking at... uh, Verses 8 and 9, John uh, says to them, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, We're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Okay? So, very strong message, and obviously a lot of the uh, Pharisees, Jewish leaders and things did not like that. But it was being out there in the wilderness with this message, he was telling, he was freeing the people from the centuries of the uh, basically the oppression of all of these guys that should have known better, telling them this is the way to God through us. Do what we say. Follow the lineage, and, and you don't. We're above you. Okay, you just come and and just be glad that you can be in our presence, and and hopefully you know with our help you can make it to God. That was very oppressing to the people. That was not the message that God intended. And John is freeing them, saying, "Look, no, that is not it." You need to get your heart, you need to get your mind right. You need to turn back to God. You need to stop living the the wrong way. Come 
and let and I'm, we're going to baptize you and wash your sins away. Turn away from this sinful life and, and do right. That was John's message. That was John as the herald. And he spent his entire life delivering that message. And one thing for s- that John never did, John never sought the glory for himself. He always, always pointed towards Jesus. Again, Matthew 3, verse 11. He says, I, John, again, talking, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Never took the glory for himself. Never said, follow me and I will lead you to salvation. No, he's always pointing to the coming king. He was the herald. He knew his job. He knew his position. He knew what he he needed to do. Later, when this king of kings does come along, when Jesus is there, Jesus' ministry is underway, John again realizes and recognizes and tells his own disciples that I know my place. And he is the one that you should be following. Go follow him, not me. I've been pointing to you, pointing everybody towards him, saying he's coming. There's where you need to go. Um, John 3, verses 28 to 30, records John telling his disciples. He said, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. Some thought that he might have been the Messiah, but he said, no, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. So he knew what his job was, and he he didn't have any problem with it. He understood it very clearly, and he made sure every, his disciples, everybody else knew that as well. Now, this is the person that Jesus himself said at that time, was the greatest person who had ever lived on that on the earth. Greater than Moses, greater than Abraham, greater than Isaiah. But did you know that later on in Jesus' ministry, Jesus said there is someone that is greater than John. Okay, this earlier, he just he had said, no one greater than John, no one greater than the herald, the last of the Old Testament prophets, giving the most important message prior to Jesus than anyone, had the most important job, and did splendidly. Did exactly what he was asked to do. Didn't take the glory and didn't didn't divert. And Jesus gave him the credit and said, there's no one better than this guy. Until a little bit later on, he said, there's someone better than John. Someone greater than John. Did you know that? What if I told you it was you? What if I told you Jesus was talking about you? He was talking about me. He was talking about all of us that follow him. In Matthew 11, I'm going to read this section, this writer of this uh, study. 
describes what I'm talking about. And I can't say any better than this. In Matthew 11, 11, after noting the unique greatness of John the Baptist, Jesus went on to make a vivid spiritual point. The Lord explained that he who is least, quote, I should say, quote, explained that, quote, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. He who is least, the lowest in the kingdom of heaven, is still greater than John. In saying that, Jesus was not diminishing John's stature. Rather, he was emphasizing the spiritual privilege that all New Testament believers enjoy. God, uh, John was greater than the Old Testament prophets because he personally participated in the fulfillment of what they had merely anticipated from a distance. Okay, they were, they never saw, never were there. They could only, they were, for so many of them, they were at least hundreds, if not thousands of years away. Had no direct connection whatsoever, couldn't see any of this. The John, he actually was there when Christ came. So he had an advantage that they did not. But all believers, after the cross and resurrection, okay, us, all believers after the cross and resurrection enjoy even greater privilege still because we participate in the full understanding and experience of something John only anticipated. The actual atoning work of Christ. We're greater than John. Now, for one, that, if you really think about that, almost makes hairs on the back of your neck stand up. I am greater than John. Why? Because I got something that John didn't. Jesus, John died before Jesus went to the cross. He didn't get to see, he didn't get to understand, didn't get to learn and hear and, and learn about all of that, what that meant, the death, the burial, the resurrection. I didn't see it. I've got people in the Bible who's written about it and told that was saw it all and told me about it, and I believe it. You too. You're greater than John. You're greater than John. You are greater than you are greater than John. You are greater than John because of this belief and this faith. So here's the question I want to leave you with. As such, will you, will we herald the second coming of Christ? Will we proclaim Christ and his coming? Be his herald like John was at the first coming. Let's pray. Father, we are in awe of you and your plan. And the fact that <laughs> you have made us greater than the one that Jesus said your own son described as being the greatest person who had ever lived at that point. That's um, kind of hard to wrap our minds around. But you have blessed us in so many different ways, so many things and so many avenues that John and all the prophets before them never had. We're sorry that a lot of times we take that for granted and we forget that and we overlook that fact and don't think about that in such a way and give that the proper 
appreciation. But Father, we know you are a patient, gracious, very forgiving Lord, a forgiving Father. And you continue to guide us. You're continually there saying, I'm there, I'm here for you. I know you made some mistakes. Um, I want to still use you. Thank you, God, for not giving up on us. And help us, Father. Use us for your purposes. Use us for your glory. Use us like you would want to do. Not our will. Your will be done. Help us to remember that we are tasked with being the heralds of your son, the king of kings, who one day is going to be coming back. A day that we all look forward to very much. Putting an end to all of this pain and suffering, all this garbage that we deal with today. We may not see it in our earthly lifetime. Maybe we will. Doesn't matter. We pray that you will help us each and every day to carry on like it's happening tomorrow. And help us to shine properly the light of your sun to that dark world of all around us. Father, we love you. We look forward to when you do come back and take us home. And we can be with you forever. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. That's all I got. I appreciate everybody's attendance. Appreciate everybody watching online. And hope you have a good evening.